All right. All right. Thanks, Greg. Uh, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Dave, for putting this on. Thanks for all of you for coming here. This is a hell of a turnout. Great to see you all. Um, so uh, Greg asked me to speak about the drone ecosystem. But before I do that, besides my friend Cyrus, who's there, my, my former business partner, um, anybody know what this picture is? I don't see any hands. Well, this is the reason why Santa Monica is such a great place to be a drone entrepreneur. This is a picture from 1924 when the Douglas World Cruisers took off from Santa Monica Airport and flew around the world, the first airplanes that ever flew around the world. And in 1921, Donald Douglas established the first commercially viable aircraft company here in Santa Monica. Um, this is a picture of his factory in 1944 when 44,000 people worked at the Santa Monica Airport building the Douglas DC-3, the first commercially viable airliner. Um, so Santa Monica has really been the home of aerospace innovation in the 20th century, and we're looking forward to making it the home of aerospace innovation in the 21st century. So why are we all here tonight? I'm here because when these guys flew in 1903, the Wright brothers, nobody could have really imagined that someday we would all be so closely connected by jet airliners that you could jump on an airplane at LAX and be in Thailand 16 hours later. And what the future holds for aviation is really in flying robots. So the last 100 years of aviation has happened at thousands of feet in the air. It's been about connecting people across borders. The next 100 years of aviation is about connecting this street corner to the next street corner. And it doesn't happen at thousands of feet in the air. It happens below 500 feet. So I'm really excited to be on the next frontier of aviation technology. And I'm really happy that all of you are excited about it as well. We're all already enjoying drones, accomplishing all kinds of incredible tasks for us. There's all kinds of incredible applications. Of course, we know about aerial photography and cinematography, both for recreation and for commercial purposes. We have drones being used for commercial inspection purposes. Any place where you once had to put somebody with a set of eyes to take a look at something, like at the top of a bridge or the top of a smokestack, now you can send a drone up there. It's a lot safer. And agriculture, farmers are already seeing improvements of like 30% in their crop yields thanks to remote sensing from drones. Package delivery services are just around the corner. I think our friends from Flirty are here tonight. You've probably heard of Google and Amazon working on package delivery services. But really, the applications that we'll all enjoy 10 years from now haven't even been dreamt up yet. And it's up to all of you who are entrepreneurs to think about how drone technology as a platform can benefit people in their everyday lives. I'm very excited about what that future might hold. There's a few other drone companies in Los Angeles. AirMap is not the only one. Um, so many of these folks will be speaking later today. We have companies like DroneBase and Shootly that are a marketplace for uh, drone-enabled services. Companies like ControlMe and AerialMob that perform aerial photography and cinematography services. Hoovy that does uh, aerial advertising. NV Drones, building hardware for drones, and AeroVironment, not exactly a startup, but a very large drone company in Simi Valley uh, that delivers lots and lots of drones, primarily to the military. This thing died again. OK. So the question that we're trying to answer at AirMap is, where can I fly? You go to Best Buy, you buy your drone, you're driving home, Usually the first question you're going to ask is, where's a good place to go flying? And we're trying to answer that question for people. Um, this is an aeronautical chart that a manned aircraft pilot looks at. Pretty complicated. There's a lot of information there. I can't really tell what's connected to what. Um, but over the course of many years, I've kind of learned how to read these things. Uh, but it doesn't really provide any valuable information to a, a drone operator. Let's say that you want to inspect a building in Palo Alto. It happens to be in this area where this red circle is. <clears throat> this aeronautical chart doesn't really tell me anything that I need to know about that place. Um, this does it a little bit better. This is a picture from AirMap. Uh, but this is even really zoomed out too far. This information is really not relevant to, to the drone operator. Um, this is getting a little, bit, a little bit better. We can see we want to inspect this building at this street corner here. Um, but even that isn't really close enough. <clears throat> this is really what's interesting. 
And this blue airspace that you've seen up here is the boundary of Palo Alto's Class D controlled airspace. So if I'm going to do a job to inspect this building, let's pretend that a thunderstorm went through Palo Alto, which I don't think has ever happened, but let's say this building has some hail damage, and I'm an insurance adjuster that needs to go inspect that building. It's helpful for me to know that if I fly on the other side of the street, I might need to get an air traffic control authorization from the Palo Alto Air Traffic Control Tower. Uh, another example of this is if you're, you know, well, in my case, um, throwing a ball to my dog, and I want to record that um, with my drone. Well, if I'm doing it on this soccer field, no problem. If I'm over on the other side of the soccer field, I might need to get air traffic control authorization to do it. So this is an example of the kinds of information that we're delivering um, to the drone ecosystem so that uh, everybody can operate safely. Interestingly, in, in Palo Alto, there also happens to be an ancient ordinance that dates back lots of years um, that says, no person shall operate any motor-driven or radio-controlled model airplane, helicopter, boat, car, truck, or similar object in a park or open space lands, except in areas designated by the director in park regulations. So, if you're operating in Palo Alto, you might want to know that in this particular place, you might get a hassle from a police officer uh, before you go flying there. We're trying to make that information readily available to drone operators as well. But the information isn't just static, it's also very dynamic. Um, you may have heard recently of drones interfering with firefighting operations. Clearly none of us want that to happen, so it's important to get information about temporary flight restrictions out to folks that are operating unmanned aircraft, and we're doing that as well. Interestingly, um, these temporary flight restrictions aren't all published by the FAA. Um, there are unpublished temporary flight restrictions around stadiums. So if you go to Dodger Stadium, like this place, in, the, in this case there's no game going on, but if there was a game going on from one hour before the game to one hour after the game, you're not allowed to fly near the stadium. So we're publishing that information as well, even though the FAA doesn't publish it. And then there's strange things like this, like the New York State Department of Health says they don't want you flying drones in this RV park. Well, that might be handy information to know as well, so we're working on getting all of that information out to operators. I want to talk a little bit about the future vision of unmanned aircraft traffic management. I've taken this as an excerpt from uh, Google's recent white paper on unmanned traffic management. And you can see that um, Google is basically describing drones operating at low altitude, below 500 feet, in residential areas. Google's objective is to deliver packages to you, so if you really need toilet paper and you can't go to the store, you can order it on your iPhone, and five minutes later you get toilet paper from your Google drone. Um, and so what aircraft are really impacted by this? Of course, other drones, right? And also helicopters. Greg was saying that there really aren't any aircraft operating below 500 feet. There aren't many, uh, but there are a few helicopters here and there and other aircraft crop dusters and stuff like that. Um, so how might these aircraft make one another aware of their locations? Um, Google anticipates that aircraft will communicate through cellular networks. They will also uh, communicate with one another through some kind of a peer-to-peer -peer messaging system telling each other where they're operating. And Ultimately, in very close quarters, they'll need some kind of a sense and avoid system. So whether it's a bird or another drone or a helicopter, it's helpful to know that there's something right in front of you and you have to take evasive action. So there's sort of a three-phase approach to deconflicting drones from, from other obstacles in the air. And how will this all be managed? Google's vision is for a federated system of airspace service providers. So, um, an airspace service provider might provide information like winds, like locations of no-fly zones, like the locations of other drones or flight plans of other drones, locations of manned aircraft, and help to optimize routings that will uh, keep these aircraft from colliding with one another and also provide for an efficient route. And this federated system might look something like this, where you have um, Google, for example, providing an airspace service that's specific to their operations maybe another operator that operates its own airspace service, maybe that's Amazon or somebody else, and then other third-party airspace services that could provide services to other participants in the airspace that aren't necessarily a large corporation like Google or Amazon. 
And all of these airspace service providers need some feeds of data. They need feeds from air traffic control. They might need weather services feeds. And all of that information feeds up into this sort of federated system of air traffic managers that interoperates with one another. So how does AirMap make this information available to the drone ecosystem? We use a series of APIs and SDKs to publish airspace information, making it openly available to anybody who's building apps or drones or anybody that might want to use this airspace information um, to keep their operations safe. Um, next week, we'll be releasing our SDK that allows app developers to bring airspace information right into their apps. We make it very, very simple. And uh, you'll be hearing more about that pretty soon. Uh, one example of an implementation of our airspace information in another app is the Hover app. This is a really cool app, really good for recreational operators, provides you uh, weather information, there's a news feed, there's a flight logging feature, and then, of course, there's the air map, airspace map that you see in the background here. <clears throat> this is a, a chart. We're getting to the ecosystem stuff now, what I was supposed to talk about. This is a chart of a whole bunch of, of drone companies. Um, it's really not that helpful. I mean, you can see a whole bunch of logos. But really, I think what's interesting is in this ecosystem, how do these organizations, how do these innovators interconnect with one another? We're, we're living in a very interconnected world. We have people that can focus on something, do a really good job of it, and then provide interfaces to other people that are doing other good things. And together, as a community, we can deliver um, excellent value to end users, to customers. And so you have all of these companies focusing on lots of different things, marketplaces, airspace service providers, insurance companies, uh, manufacturers. And we're all working together through APIs and other relationships that bring excellent value to end users. So the, the key in this uh, ecosystem, really, is to focus on something that's specific, something that you can do really, really well, and to play nice with others. That's really the name of the game. So I'm going to wrap up my talk, but uh, before I do, I want to just pitch you on joining us at AirMap. If you're a really smart person, if you love maps, if you love cartography, if you love geography, if you grew up looking at maps, if you're a good engineer um, or a marketing person or a product manager, uh, please see us. Several of uh, the other members of our team are here as well, and uh, we'd love to talk to you. We're right here in Santa Monica at the uh, Third Street Promenade. This is my contact information, uh, always open to talking. Please call me or email me anytime. And uh, it's great to, great to be here with all of you. Thank you.